Dr. Saiful Asmi bin Yahya uh, received his medical degree and master's in medicine, internal medicine from University Kebangsaan Malaysia in 1991 and 2001. He continued his post-degree training on non-invasive peripheral vascular at the Texas Heart Institute, Houston, Texas, uh, USA in 2005. He is currently a consultant cardiologist at Institute Jantung Negara, Malaysia. Dr. Saiful has performed non-invasive and invasive cardiac procedures including echo, trans, uh, echocardiograms, transosophageal echo, carotid and lower limb non-invasive studies, interventional cardiologies, and heart catheterization, including peripheral arteries, venous, and aortic intervention. He has seven years of uh, experience in cardiology research and clinical trials. He contributes significantly to clinical trials and has published several research papers. Um, and now, uh, Dr. Saiful, we please uh, proceed. And uh, your time is uh, 20 minutes to present your topics. Terima kasih, Dr. The, okay, Dr. Samuel, pertama sekali saya mengucapkan terima kasih kerana menjemput saya sebagai pembicara hari ini. I can't help it, but when I'm with Indonesian friend, I tend to speak like an Indonesian. Okay, thanks to Dr. Yudi and I believe you know Dr. Redin as well. So my talk today, I, I do not know whether I can finish this in 20 minutes, but I'll try my best. Yeah, It is an update on coronary imaging and physiology. Oops. Okay. Um, as you know, uh, imaging for coronary, we have IVERS, we have OCT, and I will talk about recent trials. And for functional, we have fractional flow reserve or FFR, and there's also some recent trials. So I believe I will share this with you, I hope. Uh, as for atherosclerosis, we understand from the first decade on the left and the fourth decade onwards on the right, the artery becomes more and more narrowed if there is atherosclerosis. You see this angiogram, you can tell roughly whether it's 70% within 90%, but you are never that accurate unless you see from inside. And that's where I'm going to bring you to, which is the IVERS and the OCT. So if you look here, there's also an, uh, an ident uh, what do you call it, uh, something which is uh, important, which is the calcium. Yeah? And this is also something that you cannot appreciate very much on angio, but if you perform this intravascular imaging, you may see this very well and you can plan better for the uh, intervention. Here is histology showing calcium, but uh, probably not important at the moment. So I'll come to IVERS and OCT. So basically on the left is a face array. This is a something which is uh, quite old. Eagle eyes uh, by Philips, 20 megahertz. Right now we have rotational uh, IVERS in the middle, whether it's a 40 to 45 or 60 megahertz. If you have a 60 megahertz, the resolution is better. So for instance, the OptiCross 60 by Boston Scientific, and we have that in our armamentarium in my hospital. And on the right side is a OCT, which is essentially a fiber optic and is a laser actually looking at the images so you can see the images even better. And it is produced by Abbott under the name of Dragonfly. This is the IVERS machine. I'm sure many of you have seen this. The machine is quite bulky, but the one that goes inside the body is the small catheter on the right lower picture. This is the OCT, which essentially uses a fiber optic catheter for light delivery. It rotates to create the image frame and we pull back and you can see the vessel actually in 3D even. So this is something nice, but there will be some uh, pros and cons. As you see here, the IVERS, we have extensive clinical experience whereby for OCT is still new, it is expensive. For me, I think one of the setback is that it needed to use additional contrast. If the patient is having renal failure, we may be having a bit of problem there. 
and compared with IVERS, the research is quite limited, but the numbers are going up. So hopefully we will gain a better understanding of the coronary, both by IVERS and OCT hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, like it or not, the OCT is coming very strong, then I think even uh, for me who do not use so much of OCT, I will probably change to OCT in the near future. So when do I use uh, IVERS and imaging or OCT and imaging? So can you do it uh, pre-PCI to identify significant of left main, for instance, culprit lesion, some lesion that we do not know whether it's 50-50 maybe, you want to see stand failure, whether the thrombus or the stand is underdeployed, and determine risk of distal embolization. If uh, you are not careful, you are standing on a uh, big artery like an aneurysmal segment, thrombus may fly down. So those are the things that you want to understand about the coronary artery. During PCI, for preparation, of course, sometimes if you have a chronic total occlusion, you cannot see the ostium. Ivers, for instance, may be able to show you where the origin of the chronic uh, total occlusion. We can select landing zone for the stand. If you want a normal segment, you can ideally uh, you know, measure the length and the size of the vessel. And by doing IVERS, or, uh, IVERS especially, you can actually reduce the contrast volume for patients, especially with, left, with uh, renal failure. Like I said earlier, IVERS has more evidence to OCT. If you have anything more than six millimeter, it's quite safe, yeah? MLA is a minimal lumen uh, area. So uh, if you have that, uh, the outcome for the patients will be good. So this is some example of IVERS and OCT. If you see here, panel F is a OCT, panel G is IVERS. So the G panel for IVERS, you can see that it's a bit grainy. And of course, on the F panel, on the left lower is the OCT and you can see the endothelium very, very well. And if you see on the right side, looking at calcium, for instance, panel K is a nodular calcium. You can see that on the L panel nicely seen uh, for, from the OCT view. So uh, both has its uh, pros and cons. And because of uh, you having that information, you can, calcium, you can do a calcium scoring for you to uh, do your intervention later on decide on what uh, type of balloon or devices, whether it is a rotarec, I mean a rotablation, atherectomy or cutting balloon or plain balloon, depending on the type of lesion that you find. Now, uh, I'm going to bring you to uh, some of the uh, data since this is an update. So let me take you first to this study. This is uh, looking at Minoka. In, uh, which is a myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary artery, uh, which happen in ladies, uh, in women with a myocardial infarction. Uh, it is a prospective multi-center trial. And if they see the angiogram is mildly diseased, less than 50%, they do OCT followed by CMR. So here they have about uh, uh, 2,860 patients, eligible only about 1,173 consented to study of 300 and they do OCT in 145 and CMR in 116. <coughs> so what do they find? They find that in all those mildly diseased patients, they could find culprit lesion in another 46% of them. Yeah. So this is important. <coughs> because if you look at your, you know, your practice, you see mild disease, you live alone. Yeah. But in this uh, particular paper, when you do OCT, you can find lesion in 46%, that's almost half. Yeah? So these are some examples of the lesion. And because of that, you can actually uh, potentially guide medical therapy for secondary prevention, whether you need to stand or you need to go for uh, you know, aggressive lipid therapy, for instance. So this is important. The second one is the ultimate trial which is, has come to about three years now, comparing IVERS versus angiogram in determining how to treat the patient. Here again, you can see uh, about uh, 1,400 patients in the IVERS group and angiographic group, uh, another half with uh, one and then a three-year follow-up. So in the IVERS group, they make sure the minimal lumen area is more than five or 90% of the minimal lumen area 
and uh, plug burden. Uh, this is the uh, optimal criteria that they use for IVERS. And if you see here, the IVERS guided procedure has less target vessel failure compared to the angiographic guidance. So because you have IVERS, you will try to optimize the procedure with a re-ballooning, for instance. And because of that, during follow-up, these patients that you did IVERS are faring better compared to the angiographic alone. Okay, this is up to three years. Now let's move on to functional. Uh, if you know this is a functional flow reserve, which we look at the pressure at the distal and the proximal in the iota and we compare when we cause hyperemia by giving some adenosine. And if the FFR is less than 0 0.8, then we will consider it as significant. So if you look into this trial published recently in JAK, you see that the fractional flow reserve or OCT to guide management of angiographically intermediate coronary stenosis. Again, one-to-one -one randomization for 300 over patient using FFR or OCT. Now, if there is a significant lesion, whether if FFR is less than 0.8, for OCT is more than 75%. They will uh, do PCI and follow up at 13 months. And if you see here, patients with OCT has less, okay, has less uh, primary endpoint on the right side, which is significant. But in terms of all cause, their non-fatal MI target vessel revascularization or angina is not much of a difference, but the primary endpoint is much lower in those with OCT. Okay, and now uh, from that trial, we can say that OCT guidance is associated with lower occurrence of composite major adverse effect until 13 months. Another study is a combined, which is a OCT versus FFR. Yeah, FFR is widely used as a class A recommendation. And usually, if you have FFR negative, you treat medically, correct? But for those with diabetes, their risk might be higher. <clears throat> so for that reason, even if the FFR is more than 0 0.8, they will also do OCT, which looks at thin cap fibroatheroma. The green and the orange TCFA is thin cap fibroatheroma. If you find that on OCT, you treat that as well. So what happens if there is a thin cap fibroatheroma? the cumulative incidence is higher. So therefore, if you treat them, they become better. So again, FFR alone might be okay for patient without diabetes, for, but for diabetic patient, you need more than FFR. So this is something new. Again, you can use OCT to guide you in terms of treating patients. And finally, the target FFR also recently in February 2020, uh, a systemic review meta-analysis of 7,000 patients found that post-PCI FFR is associated with a low risk of repeat PCI. So what they do here, <clears throat> they do a post-PCI coronary physiology measurement yeah, in patients who has uh, angina and look for quality of life as well. And uh, they compare for the uh, FFR, which you target for above 0 0.9. If you have less than 0 0.9, you have to optimize further. You will try to guide the, 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 the therapy based on physiology guided incremental optimization strategy or PIOS. Meaning that if you have an FFR of 0 0.8, you won't be happy. You will try to make it more than that of 0 0.9. So for patients which you aim for 0 0.9, yeah, will have a, 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 a will will show you a better outcome compared to the control. So here we can see that if you have a 0 0.9 and above, the result will be much better compared to no FFR or patient with less than 0 0.9. So uh, I think uh, I've gone through that. So uh, in conclusion, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, 
I have told you about the intravascular imaging. We share, we have IVERS and OCT and the recent trials and the functional uh, imaging of the, uh, of the coronary, which is the FFR. And we have uh, many trials that have come about. And I think we do not stop there at 0 0.8. We try to improve the FFR to become more than uh, 0 0.9 to get better result. And in diabetes, probably is better. Despite the good FFR, you may still want to do uh, you know, OCT to look for thin cat fibroatheroma to treat despite a normal FFR. With that, I thank you.